Have thine own way, Lord. This should be our prayer. You should be every day of your life. Wake up in the morning, go on your knees or sit around and talk to God and say to Him, Lord, today, as I'm going about my way, have thine own way, Lord. But like I said, you know, it is uh, important for you to understand that when you pray, you need to mean what you say. Because certainly that day, there might be something happening which you might like or not like, but it might be God's way. So you have to understand, when you say, over my whole being, absolute, absolute sway, what does the word absolute mean? Totally, everything, fill with thy spirit, and thank God that when we say, have thine own way, Lord, that he doesn't leave us as orphans. No, John, what does he do? He gave us his son, didn't he? He gave us his spirit. And where is his spirit? The Bible says he lives in us. He's not just with us, but he's in us. You know, I've had over the lifetime a lot of people who say, I'll be with you. I'll be with you always. And they can't, they can't promise that, can they? Because they leave, and a lot of people have left your life, haven't they? But you know what he will do? He will be with us. How? Because he's in us. Till all shall see Christ only always living in me. It is so wonderful. And, uh, you know, I was praying during the week, and as I pray these days, because we're not going through the book of Mark, and we will return to the book of Mark, going through verse by verse, because I still believe there is so much gold there, and there's so much there that we can still grow on in finishing the book of Mark. But for the 21, I've been praying every week, and I say, Lord, what is the message? What do you want to tell the people? What is it that you want to say to them? Because, brother and sister, as each one of you came through those doors, every week your circumstances change. Every single week. We are not computers. Have you noticed? It's not as if we walk around bitty, 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 you know, computers. We are people, and people has got circumstances. Circumstances change week by week. Some circumstances stay with us for a little bit longer, and some of these circumstances sap the energy out of our bodies. Do you know what I'm talking about? They sap us, they they tire us, they bring us down, they drain us, and all of these things. And then we come here on a Sunday, and what I want from God on a Sunday is I want God to speak to me then. Is it? And I pray, Lord, please, speak to the people. And for 2021, I believe the Lord has laid it upon this preacher's heart to preach about you and myself in the world we are living because you can't escape this world. You will walk out of this place. It's so wonderful in here, isn't it? We all talk about Jesus. Isn't it right? We all talk about His love. And we all accept one another. Is that right? It's not as if you're going to stand up and testify like you've done this morning and you say, praise to God, praise to Jesus, that somebody in here is going to stand up and say, away with Jesus. It's not going to happen in this place. No, because we're all here and we're all cozy together, aren't we? With all of our circumstances. But the moment you walk out of this door and you're going to Bunnings and you stand there in one of the aisles and you go, I just want to testify about Jesus today. What's going to happen? So we're living in this world. If you go to your workplace... And, and where they've got all of their lunch and everybody sitting around and you go, excuse me, excuse me, everybody, attention, I want to testify about Jesus. What's going to happen? They get upset and they chase you out. So we are living in this world. Until the day you blow out your last breath, you will be in this world. And until that day, you will have circumstances. And things will go good. And you will be happy about it. You will rejoice. You will be joyful. New things will happen like in your lives. It's exciting to go into another state. It is exciting to go to a warmer place. But just get it from me. Okay, for three months of the year, it's really hot there. 
But we're living in this world. And how do we live in this world? And then the world is becoming so crazy. Who knows what I'm talking about? What is, what is right is now all of a sudden wrong. And what is wrong is all of a sudden acceptable. And they take this wrong, acceptable new norm. Have you heard that phrase? And they take this new, acceptable new norm and they, they dish it up to your children and to you and they influence your decisions. Just see what the advertisement of Coca-Cola did to a lot of people. You advertise it and all of a sudden people go and buy it. Why? Because they influence your mindset. This is the world we're living in. So we all come here every day with all of our circumstances. You carry it with you into this place. And my prayer during the week is, Lord, what message do I bring to you in this moment? And the Lord has got his theme going. You know, I started counting it part one, part two, part three. I'm not doing it anymore, have you noticed? Because there's no parts one, two, three, and God. It's all one message. So I want to talk to you today about the way of the godly man. The way of the godly man. How do a godly man... And, and look, this is not a new message, is it? I mean, two weeks ago, what did we go? We, we spoke about walk worthy, didn't we? A few weeks before that, we started preaching about how to live a holy life in an unholy world. How many weeks did we spend on this? This is not new. And, and brother and sister, when I prayed during the week and, and the psalm that I'm going to go through today, the Lord, re, He just pressed it down on my heart. There's so many other sermons that I, that I got in the last four weeks that's just written in my journal. I want to preach them. But I can't. When I prayed about this, it is as if the Lord directed me again to talk about this. So I think, I absolutely think if God repeats something, it is important, isn't it? Whenever you read the Bible and He says, verily, verily, then He repeats it. Then it's important. So I think, I know let me correct myself. That God wants to talk to you and me about the lives that we live in this world. Because it is going to become more intense and more complicated. I don't want you to think that this preacher is a doom preacher. I'm not a negative preacher. Because in the midst of the storm, in the darkest of the night, there's always a light. There's always a light. And let me tell you, when you stand in the darkest of your circumstances and situations and you look up in all of this darkness and there is a light, guess what's going to happen? You are going to be drawn to the light. I've experienced this personally. We were on a boat on a cruise into the islands and I was standing on this big ship out one night and the lights were off. It was somewhere, you know, maybe one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. People are in their beds. I went out on the balcony and it is, I don't know about you, but I've seen it for myself. In the ocean, there is no lights. There's no street lights there. On this particular night, there was no moon and stars that I could see that looked up. And I could just look into blackness, darkness. That's all I could see. But this night, when I looked over, there was just a small... I thought, I thought for a moment, am I seeing things? This is how small it was. Am I, am I, am I seeing a mirage? Am I, is this true? But as I looked into the pitch darkness, there in the distance was a small little light. And you know what went through my mind? Where there is light, there is life. And I wondered for a moment, who is there? Isn't it right? I wondered for a moment, is it a, is it a man? Is it, is it a family? Is it a yacht? Is it a small island? But who is at that light? Who is happy? Who is in the inhabitants of that light? 
And let me just say this morning, brother and sister, as you and I in our spiritual life are standing on the deck of a ship of sin, and we look into the darkness that sin brings over your life, and you see, and you see the light that comes from heaven, my brother. When you see that light, the question in your heart is, who is at that light? And I've got good news for you this morning. His name is Jesus. And you should shout hallelujah. And you see, with His light, He brings to us salvation. He brings liberty. He brings freedom, which is liberty. Just another word. He brings freedom. And what does He bring with us as well? He brings to us that thing that we all crave for, and that is is peace that surpasses all understanding. So, I care about your circumstances as you walked in here this morning. To this point that I want to bring you to the light. Yeah? So how? How do we live? How do we walk? The way of a godly man. Let's open up in Psalm and we explore what the Lord wants to speak to us out of His Word. Psalm chapter 1. And by the way, I love this Psalm. And if you want to go and study this afterwards, it's really easy to find the Psalm. Why? Because it's the first Psalm. (laughs) You don't have to get confused which Psalm it is. It's Psalm number 1. Unro numo. Nomer ien. Italian. How do you say it in Italian? Puno. Okay, how do you say it in Argentinian? I think everybody knows now it's number one. So if you want to go and study it, it's so, and it's a marvelous psalm. It's interesting for me to see that the psalmist start this way, the books of psalm. In verse one, he said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but His delight is in the law of the Lord and His law. He meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters, the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whether he does shall prosper. The ungodly, The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. A few moments. Read it again for yourself. Let the word sink in. While you do that, ask the Lord this morning. Say, Lord, speak to me. Is there a few things that stands out for you? Is there a few things in this, in this, in this psalm that draw your attention? You say, but you don't know my circumstances, preacher. This is not truly as if God is speaking to me. But wait, He will. He's speaking to everybody today in those verses. And this is my prayer. Lord, let your word that goes out upon the water not return void, but accomplish every single thing that it's purpose for in this place today, Lord. Speak to everyone in this place. Because there is a message for you. The key verse here of this passage is in verse 6. This is the key to this psalm. He says, for the Lord knows. What does the Lord know? He's omnipresent. He is there. He's omniscient. He knows everything, even what you think now. The Lord knows. What does He know? He knows the way. Everybody say way. He knows the way of whom? Of the righteous. But, 
the sharp contrast here is the way of the ungodly shall what? Shall perish. There is some things that God know. That should not be a surprise to you. He knows the way of the righteous. And he knows the way of the ungodly. And this is the amazing thing. He knows exactly everybody in this room on which way you are standing. Whether you are standing on the road of the righteous or whether you stand on the road of the ungodly. And the fact that you are sitting in church today is not the qualification that you can say, I am standing on the road of the righteous. That's not the qualification. The only qualification for you to make to stand in the way of the righteous is via the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Because if you stand in that way, if you follow the master of that way, you will live a righteous life according to that way. But if you do not, it is so evident that everybody will see, not what you say, but in your actions, that you're standing in a different way. You see, Proverbs say it so beautifully. The writer in Proverbs, he says... In 14 verse 12, he says, There is a way, everybody say way. way. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. So as everybody is sitting here today, everybody thinks that my way that I'm doing is right. The, the test here is you need to test it according to the word of God. There is a way that seems right to man. If you walk out into the world and you talk to the world, everybody will say to you, why do you bring this Jesus stuff to me? Why, why do you want to come and talk to me about this Jesus stuff? I'm doing the right thing. It's my way. Or it's the highway some would throw in there. <laughs> but I would say to them, well, get on to the highway because I'm going to show you the scripture verse that the highway is not a good place to find yourself on. Who knows that? The highway has always been filled with a lot of people, but it's not to say if there's a lot of people, it's right. Is that right? Let's read it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Jesus says to these people, to the crowds, <coughs> that day there were more people than in this church today, but there were thousands of people there. And Jesus speaks to them these words. He says to them, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way. Everybody say way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. You see that? We are talking about the way of the godly today. He says narrow is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now, if you've got problems with this verse, I highly recommend you take your Bible. You take some time with God. Go and sit and start praying to Him. Let Him open it up to you. Because, you know, brothers and sisters, some people say to me, How big is your church? And I go, What do you mean? Do you want me to measure the building? How many meters is it from this wall to that? No, no, no. How many people? How many heads do you count? And I go, why, what does that matter? What does that matter? How many people is sitting here today? Oh, but you know, yours, your ministry will be successful if you have X amount of people. And I go, in which book do you read that? Rick Warren's book? Don't get me started on that. What, what determines success in ministry? Is it the head count of the people? And then I would love to open up this and say to them, look, look, if we are a few that serve the Lord and we can go out and preach the gospel like my brother do every single day of his life on the streets just to win one soul, praise the Lord. When the Lord called me into ministry, it wasn't for masses, brother and sister. It is just to win one soul at a time. That's what it is. That's, that's the man standing in front of you. This is it. When I prayed that one day, the Lord didn't bring me to, to have, be this massive, you know, great preacher. No, no. One soul at a time. And I, I think I'm in good company because Jesus called them, what? One at a time. But I digress. You see, we find here 
The key to this is, Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So let's quickly look at the way of the righteous, the way of a godly man. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man who walks not. You see, he uses a negative here. He doesn't use a positive. He doesn't say, blessed is the man who walks in a godly counsel. He, he says, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor negative stands in the path of the sinners, nor negative sits in the seat of the scornful. There's three actions here which he shows us. He shows us an action of walk, stand, and sit. And these are important for us to understand. The, the action of walk, not to walk in the counsel, in the advice, or in the thinking of the ungodly. And let me just tell you, we're getting a lot of counsel today. We're getting a lot of ungodly counsel. It comes via YouTube. It comes via Facebook. It comes via your friends. It comes via TV. It comes via, you know, fake news. It comes via everybody has got counsel about your life. The world wants to tell you today how you need to live your life. And that's counsel. And here God says, He says to the godly man, He says to you not to walk in that counsel. Don't walk in that counsel. It amazes me that people in the difficult time of their lives is seeking counsel from the ungodly. It is like a spiral. It just goes down. Let me explain to you something about walk. If I walk, out of those three, it's the only action which is in motion. Have you noticed? It's the only one. If I walk, I'm in motion. I'm moving somewhere. If I stand, I've stopped. I've stopped momentum. And if I sit, I am there. You need to move me if you want to move me. I weigh 120 kilograms. You'll have to move me. If I sit, I sit. But here is the thing about this. The, the, the council is connected to the walking, to the motion. And this is what they are trying to do. While you are moving with your thoughts, they come and they interject with their council to try to sway you away from where you're going. Are, are you clear with me? Watch out for the influences upon your life, especially now. Watch out for that. Watch out for so-called Christian counselors who try to come and counsel outside of the Word of God. This is the only moving one. If you walk, they come and they say to you, where you're walking is not right. Just veer off a little bit to this way. And then you veer off to this way and you walk in a different direction. And then somebody comes to you and say, no, no, you, you're wrong again. You need to veer off a little bit further. This is not where you find Christ. You find Him there. And people are all over the place. No wonder the Bible says that some are like waves in the sea tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Brother and sister, in my life I made it out. When the Lord saved my soul graciously, I had a hunger for the Word, and I still have that hunger. And I went into this Word, and I devoured it. I mean like I've read it, and I've studied, and I've read. I'm not saying I'm cleverer than you. By far not. Because the more I study the Word of God, the more I realize how little I know. But here is the thing. I am set on the Word of God. This is so, so, you know, so many times over the years that we've been in ministry, there's people coming in who try to influence me about the preaching of the Word. And the only thing I say to them, if it is not written, I don't want to hear it. And you see what happens? Eventually they go to find someone else. But here is the thing. I'm not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. This is the warning to you and me. Now, he goes on to the next step and he says, who stands. Now, standing is a behaving what are you standing for? You know, somebody said, if you don't stand for, if you don't stand for something, you will stand for nothing. Is that right? Or you will fall for nothing. Yes. What are you standing for? What is your behavior showing? And here he says, nor, nor stand in the path of the sinners, the ungodly and the sinners. And then the next one is to sit 
And that's a, a presence of belonging. If, if I walk past and I see you walking past a group of people, I will not associate you with that people. If you stand in the midst of them, I will say that you are with them. But if you sit, I will know that you are with them. It's here that we should not sit in the seat of the scornful, the ones who scorn about these things. And what about this man? The delight of the godly man is in verse 2. He says, but his delight is in the what? In the law of the Lord. And his law he meditates day and night. Do you know what meditate mean? Meditate means you open up the scripture, you read over it, you ponder about it, you search it, you pray about it, you come back to it. You learn it off by heart. You put it in context. You read about the person who it is written about. You read about the person who is writing it. You go back to God and you say to God, eventually you wrote it, Lord. And then when you meditate further upon it, you say, Father, this is meant for that person, but how does that apply to my life? That is meditating. So what is his delight? He meditates on the law of the Lord every single day and night. So what is the result of that? What comes from that? It's so wonderful. He shall be like what? A tree planted by the waters. That brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and wither dust shall prosper. I'm not preaching a prosperity sermon here, but know this. In South Africa, we had a river called the Val River. It's a big river. It's like the Murray, the mighty Murray River. We, we in South Africa thought, you know, I, as a South African, think that river is mightier than the mighty river, the Murray River. But anyway, it's up for... But, you know, the thing about this river is we used to go there and fish there. But as you drive through the Orange Free State and Western Transvaal, which is really dry, okay, there's dry, it, 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 they plant there and there's rainfall there at some stages, it's, it's green, but there's certain stages when it's dry. But here is the thing, as you come over a hill and you look down on the Vaal River, what do you see? You see the green amongst the river. They are green. And what catches your eyes? The trees. There's life. And this is how the man of God will be. As you are in this world, and the world is dry, and the world is, is, is dead, you are planted in the waters. Who's that water? Jesus. And what will happen? You will have leaf, and people will come to you. Now, it's interesting that we find this in the New Testament as well. I'll quickly go through this. He says in verse, uh, the, the walk, if we look at the New Testament, Romans chapter 6 verse 4, he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into his death, that just as Christ was raised from death by glory to the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. You see that? Romans 8 chapter 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, we go back. Who do not walk according to the flesh, the flesh of the sinners and the scornful, but they walk according to the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. The New Testament saints stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand. In what do we stand? The gospel by which you also were saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you. Ephesians 6 verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The vials of the enemy. And what is the vows of the enemy? Look, look again. You see how this is so wonderful. Stand in the path of the sinners. The vows of the enemy. Satan comes through the path of the sinners. This is how they entice you. And here he comes out and he says, he says, we stand against the vows of the devil. Philippians chapter 4, 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in what? The Lord. So we've got something to stand for. What? The gospel and the Lord and stand against the vows of the enemy. 
The New Testament saint also has a place to sit. How wonderful is this? 1 John 1. He tells us there, he says that he, they gave us the word of life. Verse 2, the life was manifested and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare to you. Now look at this, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship is a place you want to belong to. Where is this place? Ephesians chapter 2, 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. In whom? Christ Jesus. What is the way of the godly? We walk, we stand, and we sit with God. Can you see that? It is so clear. Now let me finish this morning talk to you about the way of the ungodly. Because there is another way. Psalm 1 verse 4. He says the ungodly are not so. All of the things that I've just said to you. All of those wonderful things. The ungodly are not so. But they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Have you ever walked up to a person and say, Man, there's no substance in you. You are like chaff. Are they going to be happy with you? No way. No way. But my dear brother and sister, the word of God says this morning, the ungodly is like what? Chaff. There's no substance in them. There's no substance. The picture here is of them bringing, bringing the, the, uh, the wheat into the threshing floor. And what they do is they take the wheat, because around the wheat there's chaff, and they throw it onto the threshing floor and they walk over it. They get an animal to walk, and then they come and they blow. They've got a, a thing that makes wind, and they blow all the chaff away. And what stays behind? The wheat, the, the, the stuff that they want, the substance stay behind. Now you can decide what you want to be today. Do you want to be chaff or do you want to be substance? He says the ungodly are like chaff. And I know you sit here and you say to me, but preacher, I look at these people who live ungodly lives and it looks as if they are thriving. But no, there comes a day when they're gonna be, they're gonna be tested. And they then gonna run to you. Now there's two things that I want to bring out here. He says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. When is the judgment gonna take place? In the? future. And he says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Is the righteous on this earth still? Yes, we are. The children of God, the righteous. Now, both the future, but it also points towards the present. It says here that the ungodly person has got no future. There's nothing to look forward to. Because they are not going to stand in the judgment. But also presently, they cannot stand in the congregation of the righteous. It's a sad story. These people are called the sons of disobedience in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. This is Satan, there is another name for Satan. The spirit, small letter spirit now, who now works in the sons of disobedience. There is two spirits working in this world, the Holy Spirit and the spirit of the sons of disobedience. And these are the ungodly. Unfortunately, these people are still dead in their trespasses and sins. And if I go back to Psalm 1, you remember what it is? The scornful, the sinners. And this is what it warns us about, not to walk, not to, not to sit in these paths. And then there is a judgment coming onto them. Remember when I said to you the godly, he meditates on Word of God day and night, and what happens? He will be like a tree planted by the waters who brings his fruit in, in the right seasons. His leaves will not wither, and he will be prosperous. What will happen to the ungodly? What will happen to them? Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Therefore, 
put to death your members. And that doesn't mean church members, okay? If you want to read it out of context, that, that's what you read it. He says to you in the body, he says, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passions, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, what will happen? The wrath of God. Everybody say wrath of God. Let it be known, brothers and sisters, this is not persecution. This comes from God. And it's going to come in the time when the church is not on this earth anymore. The wrath of God will be poured out on this earth. Because these things, the wrath of God is coming on whom? It's right there. On the sons of disobedience, the ungodly. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Let's go back. He says, in which you once walked. This is past tense. So he says you need to make a decision where you want to walk. While you're in motion. While there's momentum in your life. You walked according to the course of this world. Do you want to walk according to the... Let me just show you this verse. There's three things. Three things in this verse. That is in opposition of the child of God. Have you noticed? First of all, he says, the world. The world is against the child of God. Have you noticed? If you haven't noticed, wake up. Turn to the person next to you and say, wake up. Come on, do it. It's, it's, the, it's the world according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan is against the child of God. And then there's a third one which comes in verse 3. He says, according to your own flesh, your fleshly desires is against the child of God. And you know what it makes of you? It makes of you a son of disobedience. You did only get two kinds of people in the world. Only two. No, you don't get Australians, Kiwis, South Africans. Yes, those are all... There's only two kinds of people. There are sons of God and sons of disobedience. And here he talks about it. He says, the wrath of God is coming down upon the sons of disobedience. So, brother and sister, before we pray, let me give you the last verse again. Verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. There's two implications of this. One... He knows the way, because He set the way before you. Number two, He knows where you are, and whether you are walking in that way or not. He knows it. But He knows the way of the ungodly, and that shall perish. You've got a clear decision here to make. You either walk in the way of God, or you walk in the way of the ungodly. How do I walk in the way of the ungodly? You listen. You listen to the ungodly counsel. You open yourself up to them. It amazes me, absolutely amazes me, that when it comes to spiritual things, that some people, some people go to the ungodly to give them wisdom. Whilst the Word of God says, if you lack wisdom, where does it come from? From God. I'm here to tell you today, that he is still speaking to his children. I'm a living testimony of that. I've got so many, so many testimonies about that. You say to me, preacher, before you run off, tell me how God speaks to us. Have I told this church how God speaks to us? Have I told you before? Can I do it one more time? I was going to do it anyway. Just, Just thought about that. Let me just open up in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm just going to trust God. And this scripture verse came up to me. Because you can say, if, if I do not, where do I find the counsel of the godly preacher? Well, let me read this to you and settle it for you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times in various ways 
He uses the word various there twice. Various times. If you want to find the very times, you go to the Old Testament and you look at all of the times Israel went through that land and how God spoke to them. He even spoke to a man through a burning bush. Would you believe that? Was that a various way? He even spoke to another man through a donkey. Would you believe that? That isn't it? He even spoke to the people through what? Thunderings and clouds. Would you believe that? Well, these things are absurd. It is absolute. You want to tell me, preacher, that God is speaking through fire? You want to tell me that He speaks through a donkey? Come on. You go out into the world and you say that and they'll think you're crazy and I want to lock you up in a place. You're not good for society. But hang in there. Because it gets weird how people think. Now, at various times and in various ways, He spoke in time past everybody say past what does that mean is that present or past things did it happen yes it happened already to the fathers by the prophets so there was a man god spoke to the man the man spoke to the people now listen to this in verse 2 has in these last days spoken to us by his son who's his son jesus christ and when in the last days. Not times past, in the last days. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Now, you say, where did you go with this thing saying about, you know, it's absurd. Speak through a fire. Speak through a donkey. Speak through that. I say this and everybody goes, yes, yes, no, he did. He did speak like that. Well, oh, yes, he did. But when I tell them these days he's speaking to people through his word, do you think they believe it? That's even more absurd for some people. How can God speak to people through a book? And I've got proof for this, and I'm going to give you the proof in a minute. But I want to labor the fact a little bit more. I was praying just in the last, you know, I don't think it was a month ago or so. And I was sitting in my room and I said, Lord, how marvelous to think that God, the creator of this universe, wrote a book to speak to me, John Isaac Shipman, six Commonwealth terrorist, Sandist, on that particular day. Now I know, I know. For some of you it's going to be, that's absurd. And here is my proof. I find it amazing that if I will tell people God can speak through a bush, a burning bush, people will say, wow, that's a true miracle. If I say he will speak through a donkey, they will go, wow. Now that, that takes for something. And if there's clouds and thunder and I can make out words out of that and God's, wow. But why is it then when he speaks out of a plain and simple way, out of a book, people will not pick up the book and read it. I rest my case. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, you are so mighty. You are so good, Lord. When you created us, oh Lord, you could have made us to be like animals, just bark, meow, there do all funny kinds of sounds. But you gave mankind vocabulary, a voice, and understanding. How marvelous is that, Lord? So that we can understand each other. And above all, that we can understand you, Lord. So, Father, as we come to you this morning for the last 40 minutes, 50 minutes, Lord, I was talking about this godly life. Some of us in this room would have taken that message on board. Some of us would have said, yep, I've heard it before. Some of us, Lord, you know exactly. That doesn't matter. What matters is, Lord, is that you spoke to us today.